what your body and mind are capable of though when you put it in those situations. It was almost as if we just rode into a different part of the world. I will remember it absolutely for the rest of my life. The Great Pacific Race is the first ever ocean rowing event on the Pacific Ocean. It leaves from Monterey in California, crews row 2,400 miles across to Hawaii. It's definitely the, the ocean less road. When we started the race in 2014, 16 people had ever rode the Pacific. It is a big piece of water. It is more difficult than, than other oceans because you've got to fight your way off the continental shelf, get your way away from America. The route is such that it is, you have to be lucky as well as well prepared and strong and very capable. I heard about the Great Pacific Race in July 2017. Uh, I saw an advert online. And as soon as I saw it, I just thought, this is something I have to do. I'm Kaz Lander, and I work as a sports scientist at the English Institute of Sport with the British Olympic and Paralympic athletes. It was an opportunity to do something that is so rare it's become something that I wanted to do so much that when the opportunity arose and there was a chance for me to put a crew together and go, it was almost an instant decision. Kaz got in touch, it must have been about a year and a half before the race start. We'd actually spoken quite a lot over the phone previously, so I kind of got a sense of who she was. She'd always uh, been incredibly enthusiastic, keen and eager. She was always looking for the, the solution and the way to move things forward, which is absolutely the right thing that you need in any ocean rower. To get the crew together, I put an advert out online. So I found Megan, she saw the advert online in about November 2017 and sent me an email straight away saying that she was really interested. I think the, the idea had popped in my head for some reason. I'd had kind of a really, a really kind of challenging couple of years where I realised that professionally I really didn't want to be doing what I was doing. I actually sort of jacked in my corporate life and set out trying to find what it is that I really love doing. I ended up going to a lot more like adventure and outdoors um, events and networking with people and I went along to a talk from an aspiring ocean rower um, and I just thought hmm that, <laughs> that sounds good why not. Megan sent me an email straight away saying that she was really interested and could we chat and within about five minutes we knew that it was going to work. Megan had experience of mountaineering where obviously you have to carry everything that you're, uh, you're going to take with you and I think that led to her being very well organised which is exactly what you need on Nation Rainbow. I think the question, do you, would you like to row the Pacific? The answer is yes but obviously you don't know all the stuff that goes behind doing that. From then it was a case of right booking in training dates, understanding what that meant, trying to get my head around what rowing was and how on earth I might go about learning how to row. So I think from that point the next thing we did was book in a, a first training date down in the Hamble. So we're in Southampton at Hamble Point Marina. We're going to spend this weekend checking all the equipment we've got loading it all onto the boat and hopefully getting some rowing in just to increase our training as well. The primary thing that we're doing at the moment is actually running through every single piece of kit on the boat, making sure that absolutely everything is there, we can tick it off the list. Most ocean rows you take between probably two to three years to get to the start line. We decided to try and do it within 12 months. People said to us getting to the start line is going to be the hardest part of the journey. It does involve so much, so much stuff to get done. All the training you obviously have to do, so there's a lot of physical training and a lot of mental training. It basically became a kind of 24 hour a day job. months before the race we were obviously in the gym training hard and then six weeks before we left our other crew member decided that due to personal reasons she was no longer able to row. We were in a situation where we'd put so much into the row and suddenly we didn't know whether we were going to be able to row or not. I think there was a period of time where we were just so unsure whether we were actually going to get to row and it was quite devastating really knowing that all the effort that we put in for the previous kind of six seven months might have just been for nothing. 
just didn't really want to give up and we thought, you know, if there's any chance that we can do it, we're going to try. Luckily, we'd had an email a few months earlier from an Australian girl called Eleanor Carey and at that time we'd had a full crew of four, but she seemed so great that I said to her, you know, I'll just keep you on a reserve list and if anything does happen, I'll let you know. Uh, so six weeks before we went, I sent an email to Elle completely out of the blue. It was 11 o'clock at night and I was in bed and I remember just seeing this email come up and my heart just started racing and I knew as soon as I started reading it, I knew I was gonna do it. We had a Skype call with Elle. Within about five minutes, we realized that we all got on so well and she was the perfect fit for the boat so she sorted out a few things with her job and signed up there and then. I didn't know how it was going to happen, how I was going to get everything done but I don't know I just knew within me that it was gonna it was it just had to be. to San Francisco two and a half weeks before the race start. Our boat had already been shipped out, so was waiting in Monterey for us. Kaz and I flew out to San Francisco. We spent sort of a really bizarre day kind of touring around San Fran. Welcome to Kaz's driving tour of San Francisco. <laughs> we picked Elle up from the airport a day after we arrived, and that was the first time we'd ever met her. Thankfully, we got on like a house on fire, so that was good, and it felt within a couple of hours, it felt like she'd been part of the crew for months, so that was really nice, and I think it kind of made everyone feel a lot more comfortable about the situation and what we were going to do. Elle rocked up and saw the boat for the first time in the boatyard <laughs> in California. And I think then within a couple of days, it was like, right, we're going out for our first row in Monterey Bay. So, you know, that is a full on thing to, to take on for Elle. We had to run around like crazy trying to do like a massive supermarket sweep, trying to buy, I think it was like 90,000 calories each. So we have our food. I think I'm at 56,000 calories in this trolley, so I think I need to get about 20,000 more. So we had to do crazy stuff like that, and even just packing it, we spent pretty much the longest night of our lives just trying to pack up 70 days worth of, of food uh, into food bags and food packs. We had to do 72 hours of rowing as a crew, which, you know, we tried to do in sort of 12 or 16 hour chunks overnight to try to get it down. Ocean bearing boats are built to withstand capsize, so if they capsize they will self-right. Obviously you don't want to go out into the ocean without having tested that the boat is going to self-right itself. The Great Pacific Race make every boat do a full capsize test in the marina, so we loaded our boat up, took all the equipment out of the cabins because that's when injuries can occur with things kind of flying around, and we rolled our boat once without us in it and it popped straight back up, and then we all went and sat in the cabin, locked ourselves in the cabin, and rolled it again. We were with the boat basically 24 seven in the boatyard doing it up, so we had constantly people coming by and talking to us, and people were so awesomely supportive and incredible, but we also had the routine people that would just be like, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're never gonna make it. And it was just like, okay, well, we'll find out. <laughs> By the time we were all sort of mustering outside the yacht club, ready to row out into the bay to the official start line, it was just surreal, really surreal. Leaving the marina was, was probably one of those moments you never forget. You have that initial period of excitement and then suddenly reality sets in and you know what you've got yourself in for and actually you're going to be on this boat rowing for the next three months. The first few days of the row we were in hideous storms, we had 40 knot winds and 30 foot waves. We had a job to do, we knew where we had to go and there was kind of two options, we either could give up and we'd have to get rescued and taken back to shore or we could just row through it and just try and make sure that we looked after ourselves as much as we could and more importantly we looked after each other. So yeah, it was not really the ideal start. We spent the first week pretty much on and off power anchor. Your power anchor is there basically for conditions where you physically cannot row or it's not safe for you to row. So there's, there are conditions that you don't ever really want to get in. You have to basically shut yourself in the cabins. Um, which might sound ideal when thinking you know you can just get your head down and get some sleep but these cabins are about two meter by one meter and with three people in there they become uh, just a horrible cramped box really. The cabins are uh, watertight, 
and that's in the situation that if you capsize that the boat will self-right again, so providing that the hatches are properly closed. But the other side of the coin for that is it means you run out of air. So, you know, you'd wake up in the middle of the night and because we weren't rowing, we could sort of sleep through the night and you would wake up absolutely hyperventilating And eventually, I think because we were sort of, yeah, so low on oxygen, it probably took about five minutes or so to realise, like, hey, you need to open the door because you're running out of air. A few times a night, you know, one of us would have to, you know, crack the hatch for a little while and... But then you've got the risk then of if a giant wave comes at the same time that you don't want to let the water in. So, yeah, you you can't leave it open for very long. It is Monday which is day four on Parachute Anchor. Still smiling. Waves are getting pretty big. Our anchor is still holding. Day 3,327 on Paranchor. <laughs> One, two, three. Ah! brand new situation you're in you're trying to understand the sea you'll experience things you never experienced before and actually it became probably the best learning situation for us it's just incredible what your body and mind are capable of though when you put it in those situations and yeah we kind of just helped each other through because it was the first few days we just presumed you know this is obviously what ocean rowing's like so this is we're just gonna have to get on with it um we all had pretty bad seasickness. So at that point, I still, I wasn't eating. I was still really sick. And my body just felt like it was just, you know, shutting down almost like I was getting like kidney pain and stomach pain. You know, when things were going badly or they were tough and it was dark and the weather was really bad, kind of sitting on the oars and thinking, actually Elle's doing this whilst being sick every kind of 10 or 15 minutes. We're here and like, we've got to support her through this, but actually, she was almost the one that was providing so much motivation and inspiration for us to keep going and pushing through that if Elle was rowing, there was absolutely no excuse for us not to be rowing and not putting in 100% effort. So, yeah, it was incredible. The memorable moment was day 17 when I ate my first full, like, hot meal pack and I got to the end of it and I wasn't sick and I just, that moment, I just felt calm and I think I was I just had this moment of you know knowing that it was going to be okay. To keep us motivated on the boat we fortunately had an incredible music system which pumped out the tunes extremely loudly so we pretty much rode the entire 62 days with that music system on 24 hours a day. Whether it was listening to particular music or podcasts sometimes we'd like listen to audiobooks together, that played the biggest part in keeping us kind of mentally sane. It's the only way you could put variety into it. The rest of it's totally out of your control. But yeah, we sort of settled into our routine. Elle would cook our first meal of the day when she came off her shift sort of late morning. I would cook the afternoon meal. Kaz was sort of a star with constantly getting the bucket and getting all the water out of the bilge because our bilge pump broke. Daily life, it's just yeah, still had to do our washing, our cleaning, tidying everything. We managed to get off the shelf, which was one of the huge challenges um, that, yeah, we were sort of obviously willing ourselves through, but it was one of, one of the biggest challenges right up front um, in, in the race, so we're really pleased to do that. Hopefully in the next couple of days, uh, due to hit the tropics, and uh, we can ditch some of the some of the wet weather gear that we're living in. It's been, yeah, 24/7 of being wet, soaking, soaking wet, freezing cold, damp, uh, and we cannot wait to hit some sunshine. So bring it on. I don't think any of us were prepared that we were going to spend the first 29 days not seeing the sun. Day 30, the sun came out, and then it was almost as if we just rode into a different part of the world. Things suddenly became much easier and so it was just yeah that second half was so enjoyable and it was so nice just to have blue skies and sun. Rowing as a crew of three I think was ideal it was a perfect amount it was a perfect number everything just seemed to fit around this magic number of three crew of three three hours on and off it just it just worked. We 
agreed that on the boat, wherever possible, it was totally a democracy with, with three equal people with equal opinions and none of us knows more than anybody else and we want it to be entirely team, 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 team. I don't think anyone was ever there for themselves. Everyone was there as a team. I couldn't have wanted a crew that were more sort of optimistic and I wouldn't have felt anywhere near as confident with anybody else. We'll just have to row extra fast over. <laughs> We'd broken down the row into specific points, so we always had something to aim towards. 2,400 miles is a really long, long way, so we wanted some little smaller goals to work towards. So obviously halfway is a big goal. So we're on the lead up to 12, well, we're at 1,200 miles, about to click over, and we'll officially be over the halfway point when we get to 1,199 in about 0.1 of a mile. Woo! Currently, 1,200 miles to go until Diamond Head Lighthouse. 1199! We are halfway! <laughs> halfway point, that was, yeah, that was an incredible time. Just to know, yeah, you've got the majority of those miles behind you and we knew as well when we got to the halfway mark that it wasn't only halfway of the distance and we were easily more than halfway in terms of time as well gone through our kit and taken as little as possible but we did let ourselves have some treats so um, for halfway we would taken some tin pineapple we had some condensed milk which Elle and Meg took <laughs> we stopped rowing for an hour and we had a little halfway party celebrated what we'd done and suddenly the miles then were ticking down so we could then count down from 1200 which was a really nice feeling halfway oh, I've got some amaretto I love amaretto. Cleaning the bottom of the boat was, um, it was something that I was actually really looking forward to. I love swimming and swimming in the ocean and the sea. And I think the opportunity to swim in an ocean where you know beneath you there's kilometers of water and you don't really know what's underneath you was something that I was, I was probably really excited and terrified at the same time to do it. I'm going in to clean the boat. Oh, is it very cold? It's actually really cold. So cleaning the boat is incredibly important. So every time we cleaned it, we gained like a half a knot or even a knot, which, you know, when you're only traveling at two knots from, you know, the mainland to Hawaii, it's incredibly important. So yeah, whenever it was calm enough, uh, we would get in to clean the boat and it was freezing at first. Oh my God, when it gets to my belly, it's going to be horrible. <laughs> Don't think about it. Oh. It's so cold. Oh, God. <laughs> There was always that worry that you're, you kind of look down and all you can see is this incredible, just distance of blue underneath you. Oh, I'm scared to do this because there's a shark underneath me. So we always made sure that if one of us was in the water cleaning the boat, the other two were both on lookout. So we'd have some on each side of the boat, just keeping an eye. <laughs> oh, I do feel for you. You're my hero. Have I ever told you that? You're my hero, Kaz. For me, like swimming in the middle of the open ocean was one of the most incredible experiences the whole time. It was just out of this world to be in the water and know that you're so far from land, so far from anybody else. I'd say for probably 90% of the row, we were all just loving it and just realizing that we were so lucky to be out there and that we were in such a unique position. Probably the whole last week, every single day, there were just these really incredible moments and just letting it start to sink in that, you know, at that point we were maybe really going to, to do it. You know, we still weren't counting our chickens before they hatched, but, you know, we obviously knew by that point we were in with a pretty, you know, better and better chance of getting to the end, I suppose. I loved every moment of the row, but there was definite highlights, the sunrises and the sunsets that you see out there. The sky, like seeing the sky turn like a million different colours and the water being a million different colours and everything bouncing and reflecting off it. Seeing mahi-mahi and all the fish, like bright blue fish streaking through the water next to you. Oh, I don't think I ever want to leave the boat. Three days left. Last few days, they were they were a really sort of mixed bag of emotions. It was really hard to understand. I think in those last few days that it was going to come to an end. And I think has had some. She certainly had some uh, low moments. I think in those last couple of days. 
first saw land it was incredible and we kind of knew you know that we were only had another 200 miles to row and actually what 62 days ago had looked almost like it was a dream and we'd obviously hoped that everything would go right for us that in 200 miles time we were going to make it we knew that we'd get in quite early in the morning and we ended up going a lot slower uh, than what we thought we had some really strong headwinds, and so I think at one stage we were only going about half a knot. So then by our calculations, it was going to take us another, you know, eight or nine hours before we get into the yacht club. And then sort of as we came around one of the headlands, we sort of got a bit more protection from the wind, and then we picked up a bit of current as well, and we really ended up getting a lot more speed. And so then we got to the finish line. So we're looking around, and there's no one there, so we crossed the finish line alone. So here we've got the Diamond Head Lighthouse. We have the crew of Pacific Terrific and we have the Diamond Head Buoy. Woo! But you know what? It felt totally the right thing that we crossed that finish line and it was just the three of us there. We did this all the three of us, so it's pretty right that we finished it, the three of us, and then had everyone sort of come and celebrate. We have a supporters finish line in Waikiki we became the first crew of three male or female to row the Pacific Ocean and the youngest crew of three to row any ocean in the world. It was just happiness to be honest, complete happiness. It was kind of one of those really overwhelming moments. Kind of realised the first time that we actually had achieved it. It didn't sink in and I think it doesn't sink in and it won't sink in. I will remember it absolutely for the rest of my life. to see an ocean rowing crew that step off with such a, a sense of camaraderie, of friendship, of absolute joy at having completed their journey together. Everything was very, very simple on the boat and for the most part insanely, insanely enjoyable and wonderful and magical and amazing. It's very rare that you can get away from social media and just really feel that kind of one with nature and what you're doing. If I could, I'd want everyone to experience it. If I can go through that experience, if I can spend 62 days at sea, if we can go through everything that we went through, that there's not many things I think that life can throw that, uh, you know, would be much of a curveball after that, you know, and just sort of seeing the way that your body and mind can adapt. So, yeah, it's, it's a calmness that's, it's just, it's unlike anything else I've experienced, so yeah, I do, I feel changed. <laughs>
even in the worst possible situations that you can imagine, they were always up be enjoying what they were doing, laughing, joking, enjoying the moment. Being able to do that was, uh, was I think, vital and, and key to, to their success. And you know, whatever happens next, that's it's sort of a benchmark really for other ocean rowing teams to moving forward to, to look back and reference what works for Pacific Terrific. I look at it and think, well, I'm just a really normal person and I've gone and done that. So it, yeah, it feels a bit kind of surreal. But then I like that and I hope that that kind of means that for anybody else who thinks of themselves as a pretty normal person can go and do something that perhaps is a bit extraordinary or, or out there too. I think probably two years ago, rowing an ocean was this pipeline dream that I kind of thought, wow, that's amazing, but other people do that. I, I, these people do that and that's not me. And I think I've kind of realized, you know, if you want something hard enough, then you can just go for it. Ah, oh, why row an ocean? Uh, it's probably the most asked question and the least understood, even by people who row oceans. You will never understand why people would want to row an ocean. An ocean rowing, I think, teaches people if you want to do something, all you've got to do is take enough strokes and you'll get there. You know, take enough steps towards your goal and, and you'll be able to make it possible. Job this. Safety first. Have you ever met Miss Lindy? She's a gal with the bright red hair. Now nah, she stands out from all the rest. You know her anywhere. Where she's mine. Yeah, she's mine. Well, I love that little girl with the bright red hair. Take two, take 47, take 95. This is scene one, take 937. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Where I love that little girl, I really 